Today's video is Unit 5 Evolution, and it's a supplemental video for 5.A about Lamarck and Darwin. We're going to be using Lamarck and Darwin's theories along with uh, the theories of how life began throughout our work in this unit. Lamarck uh, was born in the late 1700s, and his theories were largely ignored and attacked during his lifetime. But in fact, Darwin and uh, other scientists called him a great zoologist and a revolutionary evolutionist. In fact, Darwin called Lamarck, uh, said Lamarck was the first man whose conclusions on the subject excited much attention. Lamarck came up with a theory of inheritance through acquired characteristics. And he had two laws. The first law was the law of use and disuse. Basically, if an animal was using or disusing certain features or characteristics, it caused those structures to either enlarge or shrink. So if we take an example here, uh, if a species no longer used a trait um, or disused that trait, then the trait would eventually disappear over time. Let's take a salamander for, exist for example, and salamanders uh, have a hard time walking in tall grass because they have short legs. And so if salamanders had to get through that grass, uh, instead of walking, maybe they would slither on their bellies. Since salamanders weren't going to use their legs anymore, then over time, Lamarck would say that salamanders would probably lose their legs eventually and pass that trait of having no legs onto its offspring. He didn't have any experimental or observational data for this, but he, he thought that this explained that uh, these changes would then be irritable, and so we would have uh, we would have this inheritance be continuous and gradual through all organisms as they adapted to their environments. Lamarck didn't believe in extinction, rather he figured that species disappeared because they evolved into new and better species. Darwin knew Lamarck's work very well and actually talked a lot about him in his writings. Uh, Darwin originally started by studying medicine in college, but couldn't stand the sight of blood, so he quickly changed to botany and uh, naturalists and a mentor of his recommended him for, to be a naturalist on the HMS Beagle. A naturalist would collect specimens from different places and, and compare and contrast those specimens. And that's what Darwin did. Darwin collected specimens from different places like the Pacific Islands, the Galapagos Islands, and South America for five years. He made observations on all of these things, uh, including the finches of the Galapagos Islands, and compared them to fossils he found in other places. And he concluded uh, from these findings uh, that there were similarities among species all over the world. And when he published a book called The Origin of Species by the Means of Natural Selection in 1850, he not only showed his research, but he provided a mechanism for evolutionary change called natural selection. We know natural selection now as uh, as uh, the, the survival of the fittest. There were two major points to his book. Number one, today's organisms descended from a different ancestral species. Now these species didn't change uh, based on whether they used or disused uh, different characteristics, but these species uh, descended based on what characteristics were best fit for the environment that they were living in. And so eventually over time, those that had the best characteristics were going to survive. The second point was that natural selection provided the mechanism for evolutionary change. And any time that a scientist uh, talks about something that may have happened, a theory that may have happened, the next question that comes up is, well, what is the mechanism? And so natural selection was uh, Darwin's mechanism for change. Uh, as I said, this was called survival of the fittest, uh, which we've all heard before. There were five factors that Darwin and his, and his uh, fellow scientists 
talked about in this book. The first was if individuals were allowed to reproduce at will, that the population of that species would increase exponentially. But they also noticed that population size tends to stay constant. Uh, it tends to remain stable. So what was going on there? And so they said in most environments, the resources are limited, which supports a competition within that population. And if there's competition, those that are best suited to do the hunting or to mate or to build nests or whatever the case may be, those with the best characteristics are going to end up surviving and reproducing. Those with lesser characteristics end up not surviving. The fourth postulate for him was that no two individuals were exactly alike. Uh, basically our DNA fingerprint without him knowing really what DNA was. And so these individuals, when they reproduce, it allows for variation to be passed along. And the struggle for survival partly depends on these inherited traits. The unequal ability for survival or for reproduction eventually leads to favorable changes in characteristics over generations. During Darwin and even before Darwin, people wondered about the origin of life. And a, a word for that is biogenesis, the production of living organisms from other living organisms. Uh, there's three that we want to talk about here today, and I'll just list them quickly here. The first is the theory of spontaneous generation. The second is the protocell theory, in which uh, we had cell-like organisms um, that weren't really cells, but they came together to be cells. And then the final one is one that we've all heard of, the Big Bang Theory. So let's look at these a little bit closer. The first one, spontaneous generation. Sponta spontaneous generation basically says that non-living things develop living things. So let's take this mouse, for instance. If we were to think about putting cheese and bread wrapped in rags and putting it in a dark corner in a room and forgetting about it for a few weeks and just leaving it there, when we came back, there might be some mice in those rags. And so what people thought at one time was that if we have cheese and bread and three weeks later there's mice in those rags, well, it must have been the cheese and the bread that produced those mice. And we've talked a little bit about that before with the, the maggots and the flies on the meat. And, and we looked at some other experiments that proved the theory of spontaneous generation uh, false. The next theory was the protocell theory. And that said that we life began on Earth uh, composed of these tiny cell-like organisms that had very specific specializations and could only survive in very specific locations. And eventually these organisms, these protocells, came together and shared those specializations with one another so that they could survive in new environments. And eventually those colonies of protocells became what we know of today as cells. The next theory that came about was the Big Bang Theory, and the Big Bang Theory really talked about the start of the universe as a whole, and it said that the universe was once extremely hot and dense, and that there was a rapid expansion that caused it to cool, and the energy was converted into subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. These particles eventually became atoms, eventually became molecules, and eventually became multimolecular structures. And scientists now believe that life was originally derived from a self-replicating structure, uh, probably RNA. So the, those are the theories that we're looking at. Lamarck having the theory of, uh, of acquired characteristics, Darwin having the theory of natural selection, and then our spontaneous generation, protocell, and Big Bang theories. And look to use those in your explanations as we move through this unit. Uh, we'll see you all in class.